Why are the two primary leaders of the free world experiencing a silent coup? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu became the first sitting leader of Israel to be indicted. The announcement came just a day after opposition leader Benny Gantz lost his mandate to form a unity government. Now, Israel is entering a new phase of political uncertainty. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan is caught up with Amir Sarfati in Tiberias, Israel. Both Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Donald Trump are under attacks that are being called silent coups. So just how deep is the deep state in both countries since they are behind these attacks? Jan and Amir discuss that and much more for the hour. Here is Jan Markell and Amir Sarfati. He's a survivor, but tonight Benjamin Netanyahu is in trouble. After long deliberations, Israel's attorney general, one of Netanyahu's former close advisors, indicted the prime minister on charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. Netanyahu called it a political coup. He's also called it a witch hunt. The charge sheet says differently. Netanyahu is accused of doling out favors to media tycoons in exchange for flattering news coverage and hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts. Netanyahu is down, but not out. And welcome to the program. You know, we look at news, views, truths from a decidedly biblical perspective to help you become watchmen on the wall. And became obvious recently that Israel is experiencing a serious political upheaval, just as America is. I guess that's not surprising to have the parallel. America and Israel certainly have a unique bond going all the way back to President Harry Truman. And as I talk to my guest today and also listen to some of the updates that he's given on this, I realize that it goes deeper than what you may be reading and thinking about. Israel has a deep state, just as America has a deep state. Political assassination is happening in Israel and America, and there seems to be almost an attempted coup in both nations. Well, at the root of it is so-called term you've heard now for a long time, the deep state, a bunch of globalists or those who are pushing for global government, a one-world system. Obviously, the deep state has targeted Benjamin Netanyahu with a goal to indict him. As you know, as I speak, the deep state in America targeting President Donald Trump. I reached out to my guest for today. You all know the familiar voice and sound of Amir Sarfati with Behold Israel. We'll say more about him as we move into the programming. Amir, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Jan. It's my pleasure as always. You made a statement. You said it was online. You said, was my country just stolen from me? Now, this is a couple of weeks ago. This is when this whole Netanyahu issue broke. I saw you online and you were so grieved. But remember, Americans are grieved the political situation here as well. But you asked, was the country stolen from you? What did you mean? I mean that I thought we are a democracy where the people Mm -hmm. vote and then we get a prime minister that is ruling. And it seems like somebody forgot that you change a government and you replace a prime minister in the voting booth. I mean, you have to go and vote. And that was fully accepted. I'm always taking pride of the fact that we are the only democracy in the Middle East. That's right. Our parliament is actually built in a shape of a Greek shrine outside, just because Greece is the birthplace of democracy and Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. One morning, I wake up and I realize that a bunch of lawyers and prosecutors that have nothing to do with the will of the people and the vote of the people decided that the era of Netanyahu has to come to an end, and it has to come to an end. In other words, they will not accept any other solution but him stepping down. And they even try to tell the people that him stepping down will solve Israel's problems and the political deadlock that we are in right now. In other words, they cause people to grow tired and tired of of all that is going on, probably expect Netanyahu stepping down to be the best solution for all. And this is where I felt that the country is being stolen from me. Like, I don't have a problem with people being indicted and people going to court and all of that. 
I have a problem when it's being done in the middle mm-hmm. of election campaigns in order to influence the people to vote in a certain way. To vote in a certain and, and, way. And the funny thing of all is that the charges against Netanyahu are charges that have never been raised against any leader in the Western world. Positive coverage in the media that's is now perceived as bribery. All right, let's <laughs> go over a couple of the things that he is being accused of, and you just cited one. He asked some media outlet to back off of their negative reporting of him. He accepted some gifts such as cigars, champagne, no money, and there was no money exchange. And yet the little clip I played said hundreds of thousands of dollars is involved here. I don't know that that's true. Can you correct that statement if it's not true? Yeah, it's a trick of clerics and some lawyers. What they do, they take the cost of a champagne bottle and a Mm -hmm. cigar, and they say, well, he must have smoked five times a day, and there's seven days a week, and there's 365 days a year. and And so they start multiplying everything and with the highest cost of everything, and they come up with some very inflated number. But don't forget, all of these things were given to Netanyahu by a very wealthy man who was his very close friend. These things did not cause Netanyahu to decide anything in favor of that friend. That friend never asked for a favor. It was a pure, friendly thing done to a prime minister that Quite frankly, I don't think he slept one night through in the last 10 years. Look, I don't smoke and I don't drink, but Netanyahu is not a Christian that is staying away from all of these things. Netanyahu finds in drinking a glass of champagne or in smoking a cigar probably the little moment of relaxation in the most hectic environment in the most violent part of the world. And so I don't have a problem with that. And I don't think anyone has a problem with his prime minister having a glass of champagne or smoking a cigar if it's not bribery. And by the way, in that case, bribery is not even on the table. They just say that he should have reported gifts in such cost. Here's what I perceive, and this troubles you as it does me, is that he seems to be charged as guilty even before he's proven innocent. And we all know that the standard around the world is you are innocent until proven guilty, except for Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. They're guilty until proven innocent. Exactly. The media outlets are orchestrating this type of thinking, and the people don't even think for themselves. By the way, this whole process showed me how easy it is to manipulate people by just pumping into their brains and into their minds false information day and night, enough times, such as weeks, months, and maybe years, and then that's it. They're all yours. You know, Hitler himself said, if you say a lie yes. loud enough yes. and you repeat it many times, then it will be perceived as truth. That's what we see. And the funny thing is that every time you bring against them stuff that shows that they are hypocrites, that they are not even dealing with him the same way they're dealing with others, they remove it from the table as if let's not even talk about that. Let's just talk about him. Just like I'm thinking, the whole problem in America right now is that there is a son of a vice president that did monkey business and father allowed that as vice president. And nobody even wants to talk about that. Everybody wants to talk about it. What the U.S. president today said to a Ukrainian prime minister about that. And it's funny because, wait a minute, what did they talk about and what was that issue? They don't want to talk about it. The crime is being ignored and pushed aside. We've kind of got a couple of coups going on here. we got a coup in Israel and a coup in the United States. Folks, if you join me late, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have on the line... From Israel, Amir Sarfati, you have heard him on air with me. You've heard him at, I believe, five of my recent conferences, Understanding the Times, most recently back on September 21st. 
And we still have CDs and DVDs of that event if you'd like them. Everything is posted online if you'd like to view all messages at no cost. We've had 350,000 people view the conference online, and you can just go to my website, olivetreeviews.org. You can look it up on our YouTube channel, and you can get all messages. We had six messages plus speaker interviews. I want to play one more clip here because I'm using the word coup, and this little clip I'm going to play says the similarities to what's happening to President Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu are stunning. Netanyahu referring to the charges against him as an attempted coup against a prime minister. Sound familiar? It's similar to the language President Trump uses when talking about the impeachment inquiry. The two leaders often tout their strong and close bond, but after Israel's close elections in September, we haven't heard that much from Trump about their relationship. Here's a flashback to some significant moments in the relationship, one that might just reach the level of bromance. It's great to be with Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and his representatives. Obviously, we have much to discuss. Uh, The Prime Minister was just thanking me again for what we did in Jerusalem with respect to the embassy. So I just want to let Benjamin, let all of the people know, let Bibi know that uh, we are with you. We are with Israel 100 percent. I want to thank you for the extraordinary support that you have shown for Israel in in this building, in the U.N. No one has backed Israel like you do, and we appreciate it. I think, and I say this objectively, that the American-Israeli alliance has never been stronger. It's stronger than ever before under your leadership. Hate crimes are on the rise. Why do you think that is, and what will you do about it? It's very sad to see it. I hate to see it. And as you know, I've done more. In fact, if you were with us the last time we met, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that this president has done more for Israel than any other president. Those words, those exact words. To invite me to come here, it was so important for me to come here to the White House and to thank you. Mr. President, over the years, Israel has been blessed to have many friends who sat in the Oval Office. But Israel has never had a better friend than you. Okay, Amir, I think we ought to think for just a moment here, who is sort of rejoicing over all of this? Let's go back to Israel and leave it there for a moment. You've got Hamas rejoicing, you've got Iran, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, and others all rejoicing about what's happening with this turmoil. Let's leave it at Israel right now. Yeah, it's funny because you've got on one hand all of our enemies, and on the other hand... You also have got the Europeans that are saying maybe now Netanyahu will step down and Mm -hmm. the peace process will be resumed. That's right. They still have those thoughts about a Palestinian state as if it's even something realistic. My point is that when all of your enemies are rejoicing at something that is happening in your country, I'm not sure it's for the benefit of your Mm -hmm. country. I'm not sure if it's the best thing that can ever happen to your country if your enemies are happy about it. That alone, alongside with many other signs, are telling me that it's really the work of the evil one that is trying to remove these people from office. Because I'm going to tell you something, the last 10 years were the best 10 years in Israel's history. Mm -hmm. And just about a couple of weeks ago, it was released that Israel has the lowest unemployment in 40 years, Mm. similar to much of what is happening in the U.S. right now with those numbers. So I'm thinking to myself, where in the world can a country that is in a state of war grow Mm 4.1% in its economy and has the lowest unemployment of 3.4% and has the most stable economy and security, even though it's surrounded by so many enemies, and it's actually warming up its relations with former enemies. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying Israel has never had it better. Never, never, ever. We had it better than now. And that is why I am so heartbroken, because I quoted quite a few times what I read from the book of Chronicles about how Jeshurun grew fat and started kicking. I mean, how the Lord rebuked Israel when Israel started becoming spoiled and everything was so good and too good. And now, 
let's change it and let's remove it and all of that. But what I see is beyond that. It's not just the regular swinging between Democrats and Republicans, that when the White House is Republican, Democrats control the House, and when Democrats and the White House, Republicans mm-hmm. control. This is different. What we're watching right now is demonic. What we're watching right now is an assault on the common sense, even, let alone everything else. I'm just talking about blindness that I've never seen in the Israelis, hatred that I've never seen. Same thing going on in America, Amir, exact same thing. We are enjoying prosperity right now, but to hear the progressives, the globalist talk, it's the worst of times. It's hardly the best of times. So exact same thing going on here. Let's talk about what the options are for Israel then. I'm probably going to move on and talk to you about some other issues. I think the options might be a third election, which would be in next March. Perhaps another option, Benjamin Netanyahu stepping down to resolve this, to stepping out of politics, or succumbing to a coup, though perhaps not with bullets. As with America, it's a silent coup, but it is a coup. Of those three options, what do you think will happen? seems like it's inevitable that Israel will have to go through a third round of election. My problem with that option, although it's probably best of all three, is that after you've smeared Netanyahu's image all over, after you've caused so many undecided votes to think that he's corrupt, after you already decided that he's guilty before even proved anything, before even a trial started, after all of that, what do you expect? the Israelis to do when they go to vote. It's obvious that they damage even that prospect of third election. And you and I know that when indictment is hanging above your neck, you're not as strong as you you can be without it. People can squeeze you even more, and the leverage for the others is much bigger. So my point is, the chances for Netanyahu to run for third election and win are even slimmer than the second and the first election, because then the indictment was not even there yet. It was just, we felt it in the air, but it wasn't official and it wasn't formal. However, I can say this, I have to be as cautious as possible. I'm still praying and hoping for a miracle Mm. that the third election will cause a lot of Israelis to be angry with the way things are being done And as a vote of protest, they will want to keep Netanyahu in power. Yes, we may see that happen, Amir, in America a year from now, exactly a year from now with our U.S. election. I pray that it's going to happen because I'm telling you, when I saw what is happening to Netanyahu and how easily they ignore facts, they fabricate allegations, and they even extort some witnesses and literally frame him, I thought to myself, if it's that easy to do it to such a thriving Mm -hmm. democracy with a prime minister that did serve Israel longer than any other prime minister in history, how easy it can be to do that to a first-timer in America. And I was terrified of the fact that the Democrats are going to win in this whole thing. Now, I don't think Trump, by the way, can be impeached. I don't no, think no, he won't be impeached. Impeachable. No, that won't happen. But I do believe that it's the same tactics. Yeah, it's, it's the same the tactics. The idea yeah. is to cause people to go, and when election comes, they will try to think, oh, wait a minute, this guy is trouble, That's too right. much problems, too much chaos, too much uncertainty. I'm not sure I want him. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to cause the undecided votes to long for stability right, right, and right. everything that they used to have in the past. This is it. Well, this, this is, is it's deep state deception. You and I both talk about that. Deep state deception, corruption, lying, deceiving. You and I talk about the efforts of the globalists, the one worlders. Who makes them more angry than Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu? Both those men are nationalists. They're solely looking out for their own country, Israel and America. So they've got the world's globalists, which is tens of millions of people, pushing back against them, perhaps more than tens of millions. 
when you're coming up against the globalists of this world, that is a real army to go against, an incredible army. Yes. Even in Israel, we can find the traces of George Soros' money. Yes. Even here in our country, with all the organizations that his foundation is supporting, and all of them are anti Netanyahu, all of them are globalist and all of that. I'm watching all of this, and I'm saying to myself, am I the only person who can see that? And then I realize, mm. no, there's more. But unfortunately, it's a shrinking number. A lot of people succumb to the lies and deception and eventually say, okay, you know what, let's just find someone else. My taxi driver, I get on the taxi and he says, well, Netanyahu should just step down mm -hmm. and let's end all of this charade. Even if he didn't do it, why can't he just step down, take care of his own legal issue, and let's move on to a new government? And I said to him, that's exactly mm -hmm. what they wanted. They wanted to frame him so you and I and others will just say, why don't he just step down? Mm -hmm. Why don't he just move on? He can always come back later. He won't be allowed to come back later. Be. Once it starts, that's it. It's a train that rides faster and faster. And I'm just watching it and I'm saying to myself, when will people wake up to see that? The blind, they're so yeah. blind. There's a spiritual it's, blindness yes, indeed. falling. But Amir, it's like you said, and I've said it as well, Israel is being prepared to accept anyone who can bring them calm, stability, good times, peace, all the things that they're longing for. They're being prepared to accept Mr. Fix-It. We all know who that is. We don't know his name, his title, his Antichrist. This is part of the preparing of the Israeli heart for the man of lawlessness. I agree with you, but we're watching the preparation for it, namely... We're watching them causing the men who did bring prosperity. Who brought who prosperity, bring yes, yes. I'm watching them trying to get rid of him. Yes. So there will be time of chaos that yes. will cause them to That's long right. for someone. I'm like, here's a guy that has a record of giving you the best years of this country. Here we are causing him to step down for petty things that no one in the history of Israel mm -hmm probably in the Western world, was ever impeached or indicted for it. And what are we going to get in return? Is I think the... that's an issue, Amir Sarfati, and that's who I'm talking to this hour. You can learn a lot more at his website, beholdisrael.org, beholdisrael.org. For the sake of our discussion here, my next question would be this then. Let's say he steps down. What then happens? Who steps in? What happens to the vacuum? I believe that the minute he steps down, first of all, people smell blood. That will give Russia and Turkey and Iran the boldness. They're very afraid of him. They understand this man means business. And he proved that. He's the only person who stood against the Iranian deal and That's convinced right. a new president to pull out of it. This is amazing. They know why he needs to be out. And the minute he'll be out, I'm telling you, I know the options. The guy that cannot even read a single sentence from the teleprompter. And once we have this new team of people who don't even know what they want from themselves, Israel will be so weak and so vulnerable that it's just going to be a matter of time before we're going to get hit. And that Ezekiel war will bring about the longing for peace that will mm -hmm. cause them to accept the Antichrist. I'm just thinking to myself, what country in its right mind is giving up on the leader that brought them to the best times and voting for someone who has not even a single day experience as a politician or as a government official. Nothing. The guy was a commander in the army. Well, that's fine. Running a country is not like running a military. Mm. This is a different story. I'm just thinking to myself, we probably welcome to the families of the world I thought we're different. I thought we know better. I thought that we understand that we need to be different in this neighborhood of the world. And it seems like we're all the same. What Balaam saw, and when he said a nation not reckoning itself among all the other nations, but is set aside, standing alone, 
Israel's downfall has always been Israel's will to be accepted mm-hmm. and be mm-hmm. like the others. Mm-hmm. It's always been that way. We were always, always thinking we have to be like everyone else. And if the world is moving towards globalism, and if the world is moving towards climate change mm-hmm. propaganda, and if the world is moving towards LGBT, then we have to be there as well if we want to be counted as normal. That's what we think. Well, I want to hit on a few other topics, Amir, and I also want to touch on when we get back, because I'm referring more specifically here when I talk about your online updates. Folks, you can sign up for those, beholdisrael.org. You can go to the YouTube channel and subscribe, just like you need to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you don't, there are going to be programs that YouTube doesn't like, and unless you're subscribed, you won't even know they exist. So subscribe to Behold Israel's YouTube. Subscribe to Olive Tree Ministries' YouTube. You're just really kept up to date. With the mirror, you'll be kept up to date a couple of times a week on the YouTube venue there. And I've heard you say, Amir, and when we get back, I want to talk a little bit more about it, that only the tribulation will bring the Jewish people back to reality, will bring them to their senses. And sadly, that's a very strong statement to make. It's very true. And the Bible substantiates what I just quoted you as saying, that only the tribulation is going to bring the Jews to reality. And the tribulation will cause the Jewish people to humble themselves. Otherwise, They're going to continue to go through until that time, this deep state delusion that's going on. But it's going on in America. I don't want to minimize the fact that what's going on in both countries, and I think there's some meaning to it. I haven't quite figured out what it is. Maybe we can pick up on that. I need to take my middle of the program break. And when I get back, I'm going to continue with Amir Sarfati. Again, learn more at BeholdIsrael.org. If you'd like to hear his messages, we have CDs and DVDs of recent conferences. Check our website. Give my office a call. Sign up for my various newsletters where all these things are advertised. I'm back in a minute or two. Don't go away. We know the promises of God. We need to remember that He is faithful, and we know that these are the characteristics of the end times in the latter days, and therefore this is us living right now in the last hour of the last days Mm -hmm. and the gathering of the people of God is to be with him is just around the corner now this is the blessed hope that we have since you live busy lives and can't always be by a radio catch us online at our website under radio at olivetreeviews.org if you learn with a more visual experience watch the radio program on our YouTube channel under Jan Markell and Olive Tree Ministries. Be sure to subscribe. You can also download the OnePlace.com mobile app, and a new program will be added to your devices every Saturday. Here's Jan Markell and Amir Sarfati. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. God is saying to the people of Israel, Look, that's my name. I'm your God. I don't change. I never change my name. And that is why Israel will be saved. (laughs) That is why they will never be completely destroyed. I'm telling now to the mullahs in Iran and to the congresswomen from Somalia and from the palace. I'm telling all of them right now, Israel will never ever be consumed or destroyed. Not because we are good and not because we are perfect. It's because the Lord God of Israel, that's his name and he never changes and therefore the the sons of Jacob, you are not consumed. And it's not Mecca or Medina or New York City or Salt Lake City that Jesus is going to return to. (laughs) Jesus will return to Jerusalem. And Jesus will return as the Bible says in Zechariah 14, the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations that come against Israel, that come against Jerusalem. And as he fights in the day of battle, in that day his feet will stand on Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Jesus will return only, say only, only only when his people are ready. Because a lot of people, including that pastor, oh, Israel is is, is adulterous, Israel is, is ungodly. Well, no, he will come back. 
And he will save them when they are ready. Because Jesus said to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Until you say, blessed is you, come in the name of the Lord, you will not see me. And welcome back. And let me just throw in here quickly, I hadn't planned on it, but I think it might be wise that Amir Safadi and I hope to meet you if you are in the vicinity of Southern California. That would be Saturday, January the 25th for the Proximity Conference. Well, it's sponsored by Calvary Chapel, Tustin, California. It's going to be held at Calvary Chapel, East Anaheim, California. Jack Hibbs, Barry Stagner, Amir, yours truly. You need to register now. And that would be at cctustin.org, cctustin.org, register. I'm not sure that there's a charge, but you do need to register. And I believe it will be filmed by his channel that particular day. I'll also hope to be with Pastor Jack Hibbs Wednesday evening, January the 22nd. Don't forget to check out our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're very, very active. Not to overlook, please, YouTube, where we're putting in images, video, and more so you can kind of watch the program more on the YouTube channel of Olive Tree Ministries and Understanding the Times Radio. Let me reset the stage because I'm spending the hour with Amir Sarfati. I'll be honest with you, I had other programming planned to be taped today. The situation in Israel, I could see that it was becoming more and more unstable, particularly as it related to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And then I saw, which I always do, I keep up to date with Amir and his online postings and saw him give an analysis of the turmoil going on in Israel. And I said, oh my goodness, the parallel to turmoil in America is just staggering. We need to talk about it. And Amir, just a couple of more things here. I want you to address, and we were talking off air here a little bit about some of the cover-up going on. And we've even got a U.S. congresswoman from Minnesota, Ilhan Omar. Now we suddenly are learning that perhaps she's even taken money from Qatar and is providing Iran with some information. Give me your perspective on this. We know that there is a businessman in Canada that was testifying via video to a court in Florida about Ilhan Omar and her connection with the Arab world, Muslim world. We know that we're talking about her releasing sensitive information to Qatar. We know that what he says is that the reports indicate that she's sworn allegiance to the Turkish president Erdogan. Mm -hmm. The most disturbing thing was that the Qatari official said that if it wasn't for our cash, Ilhan Omar would just be another black Somali refugee in America collecting welfare and basically serving tables on weekends. And that's what they said. They said. Uh, that's that's what, what they said. They said that. They prepped her. They gave her the money. They prepped her to be where she is today in order to do the job for them. Now, that person overheard that in an unofficial talk between businessmen. It wasn't anything official that was said in any official pipes. The thing is that he was alarmed. He was shocked. He never thought this could be the case. And the thing is that you would expect such news to make it instantly within minutes to CNN or to Fox News or to NBC, or CBS and ABC. Mm -hmm. But apparently the media is very silent about it. And some even believe that millions of dollars are being poured by those countries in order to silence the American mainstream media. If it wasn't for the Jerusalem Post that actually quoted Al Arabiya, mm -hmm. it's an Arab outlet from Saudi Arabia that exposed a legal process that is taking place in Florida. Who would imagine? It's against a very controversial Muslim congresswoman that is super aligning herself with the Muslim Brotherhood and right. positioning herself as a super anti-Israel and anti-Semitic person. I don't understand. How can fabricated allegations against the president that are not even impeachable are taking the screens time of everyone and such allegations that are serious coming from Arab sources yes. that you and I know that Arabs normally wouldn't do that unless it's 
something substantial because they will try to cover up for each other. This is amazing to me, but I, again, I see the pattern. I see how what Isaiah 5.20 says. Isaiah 5.20. Good, evil, darkness, light, and light, darkness. A president that turned around a country is being held as criminal, and a criminal that collaborates with America's worst enemies is held as progressive, modern, very accepted, and maybe even admired personality in the Democratic Party. So I just don't understand where is the common sense of people, and where is the integrity of outlets that are funded by certain people to shape the minds of the masses, and they sin to the purpose for which they're established. I think that in Israel, for example, the trust of the public in the media and in the justice system is in its lowest ever. Yes, well, lowest ever. another parallel. I want to ask you about just a couple of other headlines happening while I have you on the line here. One of them would be, I've got actually three headlines in front of me. One says, this is not brand new, though. This perhaps might be up to a month old, where they're hailing Vladimir Putin as the new king of the Middle East. And then another headline here from the Times of Israel, Israel is bracing for a direct hit by a cruise missile. Again, this is a few weeks ago. Another headline, this is actually a positive headline, Israel's energy dilemma, more than it can use or export. Let's talk about the two troubling headlines here. Putin, the new king of the Mideast, and again, Israel bracing for direct cruise missile. Here we've just talked for 40 minutes about the instability in Israel. We're not sure what's going to happen with Prime Minister Netanyahu. Maybe he steps down. Maybe all chaos breaks out. And in the meantime, we have Vladimir Putin becoming the king of the Mideast, and we've got the possibility of Israel having to brace for a direct cruise missile hit with Israel's leadership somewhat in shambles. Talk to me about it. First of all, it's very interesting that the Iranian threat is there, yet it seems like they're waiting for something which could be for Netanyahu to be removed. I would say that the cruise missile threat goes back to the fact that not even a single action was done against Iran after it was beyond any shadow of a doubt was proved that Iran attacked Saudi Arabia's oil industry and paralyzed it for a couple of days and paralyzed half of the oil production of the country. The minute Iran saw that nobody did a thing and nobody reacted, Iran is drawing a lot of confidence that they can do the same to Israel, because after all, after Saudi Arabia, Israel is the biggest enemy of Iran in the Middle East. Iran, it seems like, is getting ready to retaliate. And the reason is that Iran has so many reasons or so many things to avenge and Mm -hmm. to revenge that Israel did to them in Syria and in Iraq. Also, may I say, even to the proxies in Lebanon and in Gaza. The thing is this. The Iranians are seeking for revenge. The Iranians Mm -hmm. are suffering from terrible internal problems. And they have to divert all the fire from the regime by doing something towards Israel. In fact, Putin is probably, at the moment, the one that stops them from doing that. Because at this moment... And that's, by the way, the reason why people think he is the king. Mm -hmm. Putin is the last person who is interested in a conflict because he wants the spoils of war and the fat contracts to restore Syria. That's what he wants. And apparently every conflict is pushing that option further away from him. He wants them, and this is why I believe that he's going to lose it when Damascus will be destroyed. That's when he will say, okay, enough is enough, and he will follow through. Oil and gas is something that Israel is dealing with. This is one reason why Putin is in the area. Absolutely, and I believe that's the spoil of Ezekiel 38, 39. Correct. But at this point, he was eyeing more the option of taking the Syrian oil, which is east of the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. But guess what? 
President Trump is keeping American forces there together with Kurds, and they are not only securing those places, but they're also planning on developing and expanding them. And he just a few weeks ago even said that American oil companies should be exploring more and more there. And so Putin is super angry with America and super angry with the fact that more than once President Trump said that he's pulling out of Syria, yet he's not pulling out of the places where Putin would love to okay. have him out of. But I referred to another headline here, and that is Israel's energy dilemma, more than it can use or export. So much energy in Israel. Well, this wasn't true 30 years ago, but this is going to be the hook, I believe, the hook in the jaw. Exactly. I believe so, too. And by the way, I've been talking about that for quite a few years now, that from the moment Israel discovered it, way before we started extracting it out of the ground, when we just discovered it, that's the first time Vladimir Putin came and visited mm-hmm, Israel. That's right. Mm-hmm. And he landed supposedly to inaugurate some memorial for Russian troops somewhere in Netanya. But in reality, his plane was full of oil and gas industry businessmen. And we thought that he's going to bring generals and officers and talk about Syria and Iran. But we were shocked to find out on the flight manifest that it's actually all about oil and gas. And Israel at the time did not give him what he wanted. Years went by and he got deeper and deeper in the Syrian mud. And now he's eyeing the Syrian one because he says, okay, if I'm here, I put my troops here and I invest billions in being here, at least I want the spoils of war. And he doesn't even get that one. And so guess what? Once Damascus is destroyed and Israel will be held probably responsible, That's then right. Putin eventually say, okay, I am not going to live with that one anymore. And at the same time, attacking Israel can cause me to go after their mm-hmm. oil and their gas. If I'm not getting it on this side, I'm going to get it on that mm-hmm. side. It could sound like a speculation, but it's not exactly speculations because the Bible says that this whole war is about the spoils Spoils. of war. And it's not about the Palestinian, it's not about Islam, it's not about all of those things. It's about the spoils of war. I just don't see the reason why it's not going to happen that way. So you see angry Iran, frustrated Russia, Mm. super frustrated Turkey. You see thriving Israel with more energy that they can even handle. And The prospect of restoring Syria is gone. Syria is not even mentioned in Ezekiel's war because it's almost gone in a way. You do one and one and you realize, okay, we're there. We are there. I mean, we are on the verge of the annihilation of Damascus and, of course, assault on Israel from those countries. Hey, the spoil of war is there, waiting. Let me use this as a transition here, then, Amir. And folks, if you join me late, you are listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I have on the line from Israel, Amir Sarfati. Again, join me late. Learn more at BeholdIsrael.org, BeholdIsrael.org. Get his various electronic opportunities that he offers. He's been my speaker for a number of my conferences. He'll be with me next fall. That will be Saturday, September the 26th. We'll have Joel Rosenberg and Amir. Barry Stagner, Michelle Bachman, Jack Hibbs, for sure those are confirmed for September the 26th, 2020. Just watch our website, newsletters, or listen to the announcements here on air. Amir, I want to use what you said to transition just a little bit, because you're talking rather in apocalyptic terms. Well, I mean, that's what you and I do. But here's the thing, and here's the way you closed off one of the updates that I saw you give, and it was the one where you announced kind of your heartbreak, your country had let you down, and as it concerned Benjamin Netanyahu, and then you reminded everyone, and we need to do this. We need to do this here in this hour as we wind down our hour, and that is this world is not our home and our citizenship is in heaven. And, you know, the theme of my conference 2019 was Colossians 3, and that's seeking the things that are above, not the things that on this earth. On this earth, everything is turning into corruption. Everything's turning into Isaiah 5.20. Everything that's evil is being called good, and everything that's good is being called evil. And that's why I appreciated, as did many who watched your update, how you wound it down 
we should expect to be disappointed in this world. It's not our home. We have something so much greater waiting for us. Yeah, and our mistake is that on one hand, we preach that we're going to be persecuted, that our citizenship is not here. And on the other hand, we keep hoping for a righteous government and for righteous leadership. We hope for it, we pray for it, but at the same time, the Bible is super clear that it's only going to go the wrong direction, the opposite direction. The more we learn to unhinge ourselves from those false hopes or dreams and to accept the fact that there is a prediction in the Bible that this is the direction it's going to go, it shouldn't stop us from wanting righteousness and from wanting godly leadership and from wanting all of those things. But at the same time, it should not discourage us, but actually encourage us to see that we are getting closer and closer. We've been teaching for years about Ezekiel War. We've been teaching yeah. for years about the tribulation. All that. These are things that will happen no matter what. It's one thing to preach about them as futuristic things, and it's another to experiencing some of those things and then having to deal with that. We've had it good in the last three years in America and the last 10 Mm -hmm. years in Israel. Mm -hmm. But let's say when it's good for America with a good president, then it's good for Israel as well. So let's talk about the last three years for both of our countries. We've had it so good that we are spoiled. And it damaged our way of coping with unrighteousness and ungodliness. It seems like after eight years of Obama where we couldn't even tell, can it be even worse than this? Now things have been restored in a way, at least in the government area and at least in the financials area and all of that. It seems like we kind of forgot that there is a picture in the Bible that describes the world that we live in, and it's not a great one. No, it isn't. But we do know the end of the story. That's the advantage. We know know the the end end of of the story. story. We have to focus on the fact that we don't belong here. Our home is heaven. And we can't put our trust in things of this earth. I don't care if it's military, if it's political, if it's our intelligence agencies. I don't care. They're going to disappoint. They're going to let us down. They probably are corrupt. They probably are because we're back to Isaiah 520 again. But you go ahead. Bring it in for a landing here because we want to end on a positive note. Yeah. And the thing is this. We have to remember that we should thrive in those hard times because this is when our hopes can only be in the Lord and this is when we can see the good hand of God and this is where we can bring to practice the things that we read such as he who promises is faithful. We know the promises of God. We need to remember that he is faithful and we know that these are the characteristics of the end times in the latter days, and therefore this is us living right now in the last hour of the last days, Mm -hmm. and the gathering of the people of God is to be with him is just around the corner. Now, this is the blessed hope that we have. If that's not good enough, then I don't know what good enough is. This is as good as it can get. I want to encourage people to put their trust in leaving earth than on preparing earth. Right now, with all that is going on, We see on one hand thriving on righteousness, and on the other hand thriving on godliness when it comes to false teachings within the church. That's an understatement. Yeah, the teaching of kingdom now, for example, the teaching of new apostolic reformation. These people are telling people it's, it's going to be great, and the church is taking over, the church is having the dominion over everything, and they promise them false promises that the Bible doesn't promise at all. And then people are getting more and more disappointed, and they are completely detached from reality. And I love how Jesus said to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He rebuked them for the lack of faith in the things that were written. The fact that they never put one in one when it comes to current events with the words of the prophets. And they were disappointed because they never held close the promises of God through the prophets regarding the Messiah. If they only believed, they wouldn't be so disappointed and embarrassed on Sunday morning. But they didn't. So they were embarrassed, disappointed, angry, sad, all of that. 
And that's what the enemy wants, to crush us and to put us down and to cause us to be embarrassed and confused and angry and all of that. And I'm not going to let him do that to me. I decided this is it. I'm moving forward. I'm pressing forward Mm. for the goal that is set before me. Just going to clarify what Amir was referring to a moment ago, because it's so important, and it's raising its ugly head. It's called kingdom now, dominionism-type theology, and I talk about it frequently. It's the theology that says we can bring heaven to earth. Or they might expand on that and say, only Jesus Christ can return when earth is made perfect by the church. Part of the problem with this theology, kingdom now, dominionism, is that all the emphasis is on the church. It takes it off of Israel's end-time role and puts all the emphasis on the church's supposed end-time role of making the world perfect, which is impossible. I mean, how is it working out so far that the church is making the world perfect? All we're saying is when you hear things like that, it's a red flag. It can't happen. The church can't make the world perfect, but it's called bringing heaven to earth. And I do want to say one more thing, and that is we carry Amir's book, The Last Hour. We have it in our bookstore, and you can give us a call if you'd like. It's in our various newsletters. Check that out. Amir, I am down to about a minute and a half or so. If you want to wrap things up, you go ahead. If everything has to be perfect here, why would God take us out of here? This is the promise that we have. He says that we're not destined to the wrath of God. At the same time, the hour of trial that is coming, he will take us out of and not through that thing. And I'm just so thankful, so thankful that we have the blessed hope. Amen. And I'm so thankful that, yes, Christ will come back to earth, but it's not for us, it's with us. And this is something we have to remember. The second coming of Christ to earth is with us and not for us. Behold, he comes and his saints are coming. Amen. Let me just wrap up my hour. By the way, Amir, thank you. He's been conducting a tour in Israel and took time to join us today. And again, I reached out to him because I was seeing so much turmoil in God's land. Anybody listening here in North America knows we've got turmoil here as well. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a new message and I'm actually showing some of the countries. There's about two, three dozen countries absolute turmoil going on because the spirit of antichrist is alive and well everywhere that's not what we want you to focus on going out of the program here indeed there is turmoil there's deep state collusion in two of the freest nations on earth america and israel dark forces are seeking to undermine both countries and i think we have laid that out here in the last hour but the bible says in psalm 121 He that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. In Leviticus 25, God calls Israel his land. He gave it to the Jewish people as part of the everlasting covenant. And in Psalm 122, it says we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Not Cairo, not Paris, not Washington, but pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray that the Prince of Peace return and save his people. I want to thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. We have a kingdom awaiting us that has no deep state influence, and it's called the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. It's perfect global government for 1,000 years with Christ on the throne in Jerusalem. If you have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to make you a new creature, you will enjoy that experience with all of the family of God. If you have not, be sure to do that today, as no one is guaranteed a tomorrow. Write to us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. You can call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail by writing to Olive Tree Ministries in Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Until next week, know that nothing is falling apart, rather everything is falling into place.